We can't just have unfettered markets where you have concentration of economic activity in a few geographies without any government intervention. We're pushing for fair taxation on the billionaires. I often say, tax the billionaires in my district. When you're looking at Russia and the dependence on oil, and that's degradation of democracy and human rights. The biggest impetus long-term is to not be dependent on petro-states. You represent a, a congressional district, uh, which includes Silicon Valley in California. Could you just say something very briefly for international audience about how you see your role and what you do? I represent the heart of Silicon Valley. You have Apple, Google, Intel, Yahoo, Cisco, LinkedIn, Tesla, all in my district. Uh, the market cap of the area is around $11 trillion, probably the most wealth generated in any place in human history. I mean, in context, Russia's entire GDP is 1.6 trillion. Obviously, GDP and market cap aren't analogous, but it just puts something in perspective. You've written a very, very good book about dignity in a digital age. Astonishing in particular because you don't expect a hard-working politician to write a book as such a sort of sweeping Retirement. account. And, and uh, you know, you talk about place, you talk about class, you talk about race, you talk about immigration. You really cover the kind of waterfront of the issues. And I'm very struck that you, on the one hand, you argue that for a democratic capitalism, so it's not a book, it's not a socialist politics. No. And on the other hand, you also say you argue strongly for empowerment and for participation. So it's not a classic liberal politics. How, what kind of politics do you see? Do you see yourself as developing a new kind of politics? <laughs> So I call myself a progressive capitalist, which means the Progressive Caucus stands for some very basic principles. Everyone should have health care, universal health care, Medicare for all. Everyone should have free college. Uh, everyone should have child care. Everyone should have uh, the start uh, in life with universal uh, preschool. Uh, and that we are pushing for these policies and we're pushing for fair taxation on the billionaires. I often say, tax the billionaires in my district so that we can give people the building blocks, the same opportunities I had as the son of immigrants in a middle class family growing up in Pennsylvania. Let me explain very briefly where I think the correction is on Adam Smith, if I can be bold enough. Adam Smith, yeah. I believe, uh, articulated markets and free enterprise. And um, the great uh, economist Amartya Sen uh, makes the moral case for markets. People should have the opportunity to flourish and have transactions and express themselves apart from the collective will. So there is value in markets, in exchange, in entrepreneurship, in innovation. But the missing part, one missing part of uh, uh, Smith was a lack of focus on place. We can't just have unfettered markets where you have concentration of economic activity in a few geographies, as have ha has happened in the United States, without any government intervention in what's going to happen to rural America, to black and brown America, without any recognition that the human being are, are, is not just consumer maximizing, is not just a rational economic actor, that we have other things that contribute to our flourishing, like family and community and place. Right. And so this argues for the role of government to shape markets to be for the common good, and not having a view that just the unrestricted market is going to magically align with what is in the common good. Right. And, and one part of it, which is very, very distinctive in the book, is that you uh, call out the transformative role of the digital space. And you also call for an Internet Bill of Rights, um, which is very distinctive. Could you just say something about what that is and why you've done that? Sure. Well, the digital space is transformative in two ways, economically and uh, politically. Economically, 25 million digital jobs in the United States by 2025. These aren't just coding for Google or Facebook. These are the new manufacturing jobs, retail jobs, the new healthcare jobs. Uh, and the reality is that a lot of the wealth generation has been in tech. Nine out of the 10 wealthiest companies in the world are tech. Most of the tech, billion, most of the billionaires are tech. So how do we democratize access to that? And then in the public sphere, this is where so much political conversation is taking place. How many right. people wake up and see Twitter or Facebook to understand what's happening in Ukraine as opposed to tuning in, into BBC or right. CNN? Uh, and what the Internet Bill of Rights says is we have to have some control in shaping the public sphere. We should have control over our own data. Can I put it this way? Because I think what you've done by singling that out is really important and very far-sighted. Um, but there's something when I read the Internet 
Bill of Rights. Um, it didn't really make me hot. It didn't make me, it didn't, it kind of, <laughs> yeah. I, I, and if I put it this way, um, if you're going to say to people, look, this is, what, this is the new power and you need to say in it. So I, there's one way of saying, well, look, our, our data and our metadata should belong to us by an alienable right. Yes. There's a sense of, of putting some agency into, the, you say it's an internet uh, bill of rights, but I don't feel that sense of these are my rights, this is how it's going to empower me. Do you well, think that's a fair criticism? I, I think it's probably a fair criticism, but and partly I don't think that these are new philosophical rights. I think they're rights grounded in our constitution and uh, in traditional political theory, but I think that they need expression in the cyber world, and one of that expression is that our own data should be uh, ours and should not be manipulated, and we need uh, affirmative consent for that. Right, but, but I'm not, I, I don't think I'm you know, trying to say, okay, here's a whole new set of rights that uh, you know, John Locke or someone didn't discover. It's more, how do we protect these rights uh, online? Yeah, but my question is about how people get energized by saying, yes, understand that, because it seems to me that one of the uh, lamentable powers of Trumpism is it is appeals to people's sense of agency. It gives them a sense of empowerment and many of the progressive causes, they seem that, yeah, 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 okay, but you know, how's it going to affect my life? How's it going to empower me? That's a good me? point. I think with the, the, the more central issue is the jobs and the economic agency. People feel the rural communities, towns left out, not participating in economic wealth generation. And we come, as our president did, and said, look, Intel is bringing $20 billion to Ohio, and this is going to revitalize yeah. the Midwest. That is the affirmative agency. You can build wealth, create value in a modern economy. I think the Internet Bill of Rights has to be about you should build the architecture of the Internet. You shouldn't be just a guinea pig where your data is taken to support a candidate that you may not, and this is affirming your citizenship. But that is a, uh, a, a secondary point. Uh, if people don't, uh, aren't having a good job and creating wealth and building value, uh, then uh, they're not going to care maybe about their privacy online as much. Right, but if they go together, don't you think there's a sense in which uh, the, the democratization of these rights is as important for people, empowering them, as the, the income is? I think the democratization is absolutely uh, as important, uh, but I think the primary thing, the primary cause, in my view, of the discontent and then the rise of right. authoritarianism is, is two things. One is a transition to a multiracial, multicultural society where people are saying, slow down, uh, and we're fighting over what uh, America should be. Uh, and this is where I articulate at the end Frederick Douglass's vision of democratic patriotism. What is, yep. What does it mean for America to be America? It's not just procedural justice. It's not just a constitution. It is some form of culture. And how are we all equals in participating in that culture? And secondly is the economic disempowerment of communities where they see, well, look, Silicon Valley is producing all this wealth. Uh, what happened to us? Where is our place? This is where Trump came and said, you built America. You don't see a place for yourself in America. I'm going to bring you back. Of course, he sold snake oil. Yeah. We have to sell uh, a real vision. Have you said to Tim Cook or to the, you know, the, 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 the great figures of these huge internet companies, I want democracy to be in charge of capitalism? Yes, I mean, I don't know if I put it that way, but I've, uh, I, you know, Tim Cook will say, well, we were building privacy settings into the new Apple phone. Why aren't you acting in Congress? You ought to be passing the Internet Bill of Rights. Uh, but I have told these companies they need to do a better job in uh, de decentralizing the economic opportunity and investing in rural communities and investing in uh, black and brown communities. In fact, I thought the president should have announced a goal, two million digital jobs by 2025 in rural communities and in black and brown communities. And these tech companies need to be a big right. part of it. Uh, I've had that conversation. They used to be more skeptical. The COVID realignment gives us a chance of democratizing that. Right, but, but there is a sense of power involved in that, of, of saying corporate power should be answerable to us, to democratic and to political power. Yes, and this is the correction of Adam Smith, in my view, which Smith said, uh, just have markets largely unchecked. Uh, and I'm saying, no, you need to have government accountability, both with the decentralization of opportunity, the check on how they treat workers, uh, and the check on our rights uh, online, so that there is an affirmative strong role 
for government and democratic accountability uh, on corporate power. But they will feel that we're the boss. Do you think they're going to feel that? Well, I think they will feel that in that it's a uh, it's different spheres. In some places, you want to give them autonomy. You don't right. want the United States Congress dictating how Apple computers is going to be formed. It would be a mess. Your iPhone no, no, wouldn't no, work. No, I, but you also want to make sure that they're paying taxes and that they're decentralizing opportunity. And this is, and maybe we can end on this point. This is the central view of markets, and why I call myself a progressive capitalist. The the thing that is often lost is markets are a human construction that are defined by democratic societies to be able to uh, help with the common good. And so what we need to figure out is how do we define the relationship of what a market is? And our view of the last 40 years has been too much of letting corporations define the rules without smart, well-crafted state intervention. What I'm calling for is a smart uh, state policy that looks at community, that looks at equality of opportunity but allows the private sector to still flourish and have innovation. Given the war, given the role of Putin and what's happening there, how do you think that's now going to affect uh, what, is, what is taking place in terms of progressive politics here in America? Well, well the biggest, uh, I mean, I think there's consensus in the United States that Putin's invasion is illegal and moral, that he's committing a war crimes, but the biggest uh, impetus long term is to not be dependent on petrostates. When you're looking at Russia and the dependence on oil, and that's degradation of democracy and human rights. When you look at the Saudis and the brutal bombing in Yemen, when you look at Venezuela and Madero's repression of his own people, what is a common thread? It is petrostates. And how do we get uh, away from that? How do we affirm democracy? We need a moonshot in renewable energy in climate policy. Uh, and that is the affirmation of democratic society and a lack of dependence on, on these authoritarian regimes that are linked, in my view, to petrostates. Because if you're a petrostate, you don't have to innovate. You don't have to be creative. You can just drill.